Now please welcome to the podium Krista Clark. She's an independent curator and scholar of the arts of global Africa and an alumna fellow here at the Hutchins Center. Thank you, Krista. Good afternoon, everybody. It is a most sincere pleasure to introduce Professor David Bindman, Emeritus Durning Lawrence Professor of the History of Art at University College London and longstanding fellow here at the Hutchins Center. While this assignment truly is an honor, it also presents the vexing challenge of summarizing David's extraordinarily wide-ranging contributions throughout a long and distinguished career that spans more than five decades. Objects and ideas have always been central to David's work, which is motivated by his desire to place the history of art firmly within the wider intellectual world. His research trajectory began with monographic studies of British artists, including William Blake, William Hogarth, and John Flaxman. This then led toward deeper inquiries into the circumstances and social background of works of art and artists. He has authored numerous books and exhibition catalogs on Blake and Hogarth, as well as on 18th century sculpture and on the French Revolution. These early interests have continued most recently in the form of an exhibition that David has curated, Hogarth, Place and Progress. The exhibition unites all the paintings and engravings from the series for the first time and is on view at the Sir John Soane Museum in London through early January. In the 1990s, David turned his attention toward issues of representation, both of race and nationality. He edited the 18th century volume of The Image of the Black in Western Art, a series that, as we all well know, was discontinued in 1998 and then revived here at Harvard in 2005, thanks to Professor Gates. David's initial work on this series led him to investigate the construction of race in the 18th century and how it was shaped by ideas about beauty, which he published in 2002 as Ape to Apollo, Aesthetics in the Idea of Race, 1700 to 1800. He was subsequently invited by Professor Gates to work on the Image of the Black series, repri republishing new editions of the five original books and publishing five more. Along with Gates and Suzanne Blier, David edited a companion volume, The Image of the Black in Africa and Asia, published in 2017. He is now working on a second companion volume, The Image of the Black in Latin America and the Caribbean. David's work on 18th century aesthetics has also led to his engagement with the philosophy of Immanuel Kant and the 2014 book, Warm Flesh, Cold Marble, Canova, Torvaldsen and their critics, an evaluation of the impact on the sculptors and their critics of Kant's separation of the aesthetic from cognitive and sensory forms of response. In short, the breadth and depth of David's scholarship, realized through countless publications and exhibitions, including nearly 50 articles, is nothing short of astonishing. One adds to this a multitude of prestigious academic appointments and fellowships, at least seven prizes awarded for his work and his service on many advisory boards in the UK and the US. These are among the many achievements listed on David's extensive CV, which, while obviously impressive, still fails to capture some of his most important and indeed endearing qualities as an individual. First and foremost, there is his generosity as a scholar and as a teacher and a mentor to generations of students. This includes those fortunate enough to have studied under him first at Westfield College and then at University College London and those he has informally taken under his wing, myself included. His students have also attested to the lasting effects of his teaching on the curatorial directions of museums as someone who has consistently encouraged, if not prioritized, close engagement with objects. And David practices what he preaches, for he is equally known for his compulsive and quixotic collecting. This passion, if not obsession, 
has afflicted him since his student days to the benefit of many institutions that have received donations from him, and perhaps to the chagrin of his wife, Frances, a respected curator from whom he sometimes withholds disclosing his latest acquisitions. <laughs> and lastly, I must add that David C.V. does not list his PhD advisor at the Courtauld Institute, Sir Anthony Blunt, whose out outing as a Soviet spy in the 1960s was the focus of the season premiere of The Crown on Netflix, for those of you who are fans. David is an excellent raconteur, and I look forward to hearing more about that. Today, Professor Beinman presents his research in a paper entitled Racial Science and the Picturing of Africans in 19th Century France. Please give our most distinguished scholar, someone for whom I have deep respect and affection, a warm welcome. Well, thank you, Krista. I'm left speechless by that, which is not a very convenient thing at this point. Um, but um, I'm really grateful for all you've said, and also for everybody here, and particularly to the uh, Hutchins Center, to Krishna, um, and of course to, to Skip Gates. And, and I, it's been a tremendous experience for me to keep coming back to the Hutchins Center over the years, and I've made a great many friends and learned a huge amount from the other fellows. Now, those who work on 19th century racial theories are likely to feel a sense of deja vu when they read that President Trump habitually responds to criticism from African Americans by describing them as persons of low IQ. Such an accusation, as some journalists have pointed out, harks back directly to 19th and earliest 20th century claims based on the conscious application of scientific principles that people of African descent were collectively of lower intellect than Europeans, as indeed were all non-Europeans. We naturally dismiss this as racist nonsense, which indeed it is, but the idea was derived not only from popular European uh, uh, and white American fantasies of racial superiority, but also more insidiously from the earnest labor in prestigious places of learning, like the present one and my home university in London, of respected scientists supervising teams of inquirers engaged in measuring all parts of the body and especially skulls, calculating the mass, weight, and shape of the brains inside, extrapolating from what now seem to be impossibly small samples the intelligence of a whole race. Each race, itself always a very slippery concept, could then be assigned a value denoting the average intelligence of its members, and though this varied according to the criteria applied, the conclusion was invariably that Europeans were the most intelligent of all races, and Africans were the least, with others at various points in between. Now, we tend in the 21st century to see racism's natural home as being among the politically far right and extreme conservatives, such as the Catholic monarchist aristocrat uh, Arturo de Gobineau, whose book, An Essay on the Inequality of the Human Races, 1849, claimed that aristocrats were entitled to rule because they possessed more Aryan genetic traits and were less interbred with inferior races than the rest of the population. But his belief in the biological foundations of race was shared with scientists of, of di diametrically opposing political persuasions, most notably the great polymath and founder of modern anthropology, Paul Broca, a passionate believer in the power and probity of exact science and the limitations of authority, whose work was, uh, was anathema to Gobineau and treated with political suspicion by the conservative regime of Napoleon III. We are faced here with a disturbing paradox. In the 19th century, the strongest and most effective advocates of biological racism 
That is to say, the division of races into hierarchies of value based on physical characteristics were the scientists most committed to factual evidence. Broca based all his studies of humanity on rigorous measurement and on statistics. One might think that a belief in the superiority of the European race over all others, especially the African, would have been discredited by the rise of reason and science in the 18th century. But I would argue, on the contrary, the 18th century Enlightenment actually invented the idea of race based on biological determinism, though, of course, European prejudice against Africans and non-Europeans in general long predates the 18th century. My subject today is not to investigate how that happened, nor its appalling consequences. Many others have done that. But how it affected art in the 19th century. This inquiry comes out of my recent experience on the scientific committee for an exhibition that ended this July at the Musée d'Orsay in Paris on the black model in 19th century France. This exhibition was originally the brainchild of a remarkable Columbia postdoc, Denise Morel, who put on the first version of the exhibition at Columbia's Wallach Gallery, one of, those, one of whose name, aims was to give names and a presence to the many black models employed by French artists. But the exhibition was vastly increased in size and coverage for the Paris showing and extended well into the 20th century. The scientific committee, which included also Anne Lafont and Anne Higonet, fellow art historians, and the historian Pap Nadie, were adamant that the exhibition should not be just a series of beautiful pictures, of which there were many in the exhibition, but it should be explicit about the racism that was so much a presence in the visualization of black people in the period. These proposals were accepted, I think reluctantly in some quarters, and Anne Lafont wrote a brief history of black representation in the previous history of art. Pat Medea gave a detailed historical overview, and, Han, and Anne Higonet wrote an essay on the question of naming. I was asked to write an essay on scientific racism, and with Anne Lafont wrote a historiographical introduction, placing the exhibition in the context of previous ones, mostly, uh, in fact, uh, American and some British. So how did the respectability of racial science affect the representation of black people in the 19th century? First of all, we need to look at what the, um, the 19th century had inherited in terms of representation. If in the Middle Ages, the representation of Africans was dominated by the Chris Christian kingdoms of legendary wealth like Ethiopia and Congo that were indirectly commemorated in the presence of the black magus in paintings of the adoration of the magi. And here I show uh, Dürer's woodcut, and there you can see uh, the black magus, young and eager, um, on the left. Um, after the establishment of European slavery in the 15th and 16th centuries, most European representations of blacks showed them in positions of servility towards people of power and wealth, based on the widespread assumption that Africans were destined by nature to be slaves. This relationship continued to be reflected in the 19th century in such paintings as Delacroix's Femme d'Alger with its black serving maid, up here, and while Manet's Olympia, which reclaims a relationship between black and white that goes back to Titian and Van Dyck's paintings in the 16th and 17th centuries, where a black servant attends a white woman, dark skin providing a foil to the beauty of the mistress's whiteness. In the 18th century, Belle Mulatresse, much prized by settlers in the Caribbean for their sexual attractiveness and exotic beauty, beauty began to appear as subjects in their own right in paintings by the Anglo-Italian artist Agostino Brunias, made in the former French-dominated islands of Dominica and St. Vincent. And you can see 
charismatic uh, Mulatress there. Um, and Delacroix's ex erotic portrait of Aspasie, uh, a, a model, belongs to this French Caribbean tradition, which continues to reverberate throughout the 19th and early 20th century in Baudelaire's Fleur du Mal, Matisse's illustrations to the poems, and indeed in the performances of Josephine Baker. In the 19th century, as slavery was gradually abolished in Europe and the Americas, racial science evolved to become a respectable, even a dominant field of research, based initially on comparative skull types of different people ranged in a hierarchical relationship. Racial science was the basis of studies in universities, museums, and anthropological societies, Virtually every museum of natural history had a display devoted to racial typology. Though they continued to be developed until the 1940s, there are few traces left in today's museums, and the biological study of race is now completely discredited, though disturbingly, it still has a life in far-right far websites. Now, racial science might seem to be an oxymoron. How can something so irrational be the subject of scientific inquiry? In reality, race was through the 19th and the first half of the 20th century the principal way of classifying humanity. It derived ultimately from Linnaeus's classification first of plants, then animals, and finally human beings, which he divided according to the four continents defined by what, with hindsight, seem to be absurdly schematic categories of color, moral character, and temperament. Europe was ingenious, white, sanguine, governed by law. Africa, crafty, lazy, careless, black, governed by arbitrary will of the master, and phlegmatic. America, happy with his lot, liberty-loving, tanned and irascible, governed by custom, red and choleric, and Asia, yellow, governed by opinion, and melancholic. Many thinkers like Immanuel Kant adapted and extended Linnaeus's categories and saw race as an essential part of human identity, but others, most notably Georges-Louis Leclerc, Comte de Buffon, saw racial distinctions as gradual and complex rather than absolute. Nonetheless, he claimed that there was a difference between, I quote, our great civilized peoples and the little savage nations of America, while he admitted that Africans were as varied in character and levels of civilization as Europeans. Also, the German thinker Georg Forster directly challenged Kant's categories. Debates in every country of Europe took place for the two centuries from the mid-18th century onwards among philosophers, natural scientists, and those we now call anthropologists over the number of races and their characteristics, the shape of skulls, the size of, and even the weight of the brain, and their correlation with intelligence and level of civilization was eventually codified in the early 20th century in the adoption of the intelligence qu quotient, or IQ. The emphasis on racial difference and the different levels of capability and intelligence of races was partly an unintended consequence of Lamarck's early 19th century theory of transformism and at later date Darwinism, which placed Europeans at the culmination of the evolutionary process, the most successful race and all others at different stages beneath, some with the potential to be civilized others suffering from arrested development. The idea that the skull, unlike skin color, was measurable and could be used to create a taxonomy of racial difference was originated by the Dutch doctor, Peter Camper, while the Swiss, Swiss theologian, um, Johann Caspar Lavater, established physiognomy as an index of moral character. 
Camper, in his posthumously published a treatise on the natural division difference of features of persons of different nations of 1791, measured racial difference by comparing the facial angle of the skull from the forehead to the jaw using representative skulls of different peoples and also apes. At the top end was the Apollo Belvedere with a straight profile, and I don't show that part of the chart. That is to say, no facial angle, though the increasing facial angle of the European, the Kalmuk, and the African with apes and other animals further down. So it's this uh, angle is at stake. Camper had received some training as a painter and specifically directed his study towards artists who he claims would be helped by it to represent accurately different nations and the types of humanity. Camper's dissertation by 1794, translated into French, German, and Italian, rapidly became a standard work in art academies across Europe. And its influence can be seen most clearly in Jericho's lithograph of boxers. The white boxer has a straight Grecian profile, while the black boxer has, by contrast, a sloping forehead, uh, the line of which continues into the lower part of the face. Camper gave scientific validation to the long-established stereotype of Africans as possessing woolly hair, snub noses, and large lips. His typology became the basis of such anthropological representations as Charles Cordier's busts of represented African, representative Africans, which I will discuss shortly. Now, Lavater was also interested in skulls, but from a different viewpoint. His essay on physiognomy, 1781 to 1800, argues that the skull was the index of the mor moral character, the soul of its possessor. A beautiful face was the sign of a beautiful soul and an ugly one of immorality. Lovatus, in fact, says very little about race in his books, except to deny that the mind of a Newton could exist in the head of a black, an example he later retracted under the influence of abolitionist friends. But he does make comments on images of Africans that suggest he had strong racist views. The effect of the skull as an index of race and moral character perhaps lies behind the large number of head studies of blacks made in 19th century France, many of which emphasize the racial or ethnic features of the sitter. By contrast, images critical of slavery tend to emphasize the whole body. Jericho, a fervent abolitionist, made a small number of head studies of blacks, but most of his other representations including those in the Raft of the Medusa, show the common physicality of humanity expressed in the human body as a site of pain, suffering, and redemption. There you've got a black figure at the top and others um, on the, at the raft. Black figures, uh, so black figures dying or suffering are shown among others on the raft, while a black figure sights the rescuing ship and signals to it. In openly anti-slavery paintings, the brutality of slavery is expressed in Marcel Verdier's Le Châtiment des Quatre Piquets by the whipping of a fully outstretched human body. Despite Camper's denial of racist intentions, his comparative charts were almost immediately misinterpreted by those wish to emphasize racial difference. In 1795, the great French naturalist, Georges Cuvier, was the first to make an explicit connection between facial angle and intelligence. He argued from his studies of the orang-outang that the facial angle of the animal was close to that of the African, and the prominence of the jaw meant the brain occupied a smaller cavity, meaning a smaller brain and less intelligence. 
This he confirmed in Lesson d'Anatomie Comparée of 1800, when he claimed the facial angle of a young or orang utang to be the same as a Negro, while the European was 10 degrees narrower, which therefore allowed the liberation of the brain from the senses. Um, in La Reine Animal of 1817, he argued there were three great races, Caucasian, Mongol, and Ethiopian, the last exhibiting, and I quote, the prominent muzzle and large lips which relate to the apes and who have always remained bar barbaric. The combined influence of Camper's skull measurement and Lavater's idea that human character could be read from the face became the basis of anthropological studies in France and elsewhere in Europe and the United States throughout the 19th century and well into the 20th century. The shape of the skull, as formed by character and experience, could be an index of the relative degree of civilization and primitivism, the predominance of the animal or the human, moral capacity, level of intelligence, physical beauty, and the ability to perceive it, always with the assumption that the European was the standard, the unmarked category against which all other peoples were measured. If the skull made such ideas visible and measurable, then it was believed not only that races could be classified, but so could criminality and degeneracy be recognized in European and other populations. Julien Joseph Viret, a popular, uh, popularizer of science, in Histoire naturelle du genre humain of 1800, drew together ideas of racial differentia differentiation to give wide circulation to an extreme view of the animality of blacks, arguing that they were a separate species from Europeans, whom he saw as a civilizing influence on the world. Rather than seeing inferior races as a degeneration from the original human type, for him they were divided from the higher races by facial angle, deficiency in brain size and intellect, and a preoccupation with sex that brought them close, close to the habits of the orangutan. One can cite a number of French authors who published theories that in one way or another provided a scientific justification for the inferiority of non-European races, especially those of Africa. Though some people in 19th century France resisted aspects of racial classification and supported the abolition of slavery on humanitarian grounds, it is difficult to find anyone who rejected all forms of biological determinism. The sculptor Charles, Charles Cordier is a case in point. He spoke against a European monopoly of beauty, arguing that beauty is not the province of a privileged race. He claimed to give to the world of art the idea of the universality of beauty and that the most beautiful Negro is not the one who looks most like us, nor the one who presents the most, pre uh, nor the one who presents the most pronounced characteristics associated with his race. One can argue, as does Lourdes de Margerie, that Cordier did not believe in the hierarchy of race with the European on top, but he does accept the idea of race and its essential nature. He exhibited three busts, now lost, but known from a medal, in the 1859 Salon of the biblical Cham, Japhet, and Sem, the most ancient division of the races of man. In a talk to the Société d'Anthropologie, of which he was a member, he claimed that his sculptures were based on a geometric procedure to determine the facial angle of his subjects not exactly the same as Camper's, but certainly derived from it. His sculptural group, Aimez-vous les uns et les autres, Love Ourselves and Others, um, made of black and yellow marble, is full of noble intentions. But there is a clear and patronizing contrast between the thrusting eagerness of the black boy and the white boy's more upright and reticent pose. Cordier's busts also reflect the turn towards empire and to Africa itself, 
that takes the discussion of race beyond France and slavery. Racial theory did not in itself drive the quest for colonies, but it did have an important role in policy towards the, their native inhabitants. The French move into Africa was officially claimed as a civilization, civilizing mission in conjunction with its economic goals. And, as, and government policy towards the colonies can be divided into two general positions, assimilation or association. Those who supported the former wished to raise up Africans into European values by ed education and Christianization. The latter believed that some peoples were either unassimilable or incapable of being civilized and sh so should be allowed to retain their way of life. Deciding to which of the two categories uh, individual peoples or national nations belonged was the business of the geographical societies of the period, and judgments were often made using criteria derived from Camper and Cuvier. From the middle of the 19th century onwards, artists were drawn more towards accentuating differences within Africa by specifying the region from which their models came, and Cordier is perhaps transitional in this respect. Titles of his Une Negresse of 1851 were alternatively uh, Venus Africaine or Nubienne, Type Ethiopienne, while his male bust exhibited in, the 18, in 1857 is entitled Negre du Soudan or Sudan. The shift between generic and more specific titles is indicative of an artist who exhibited both in the Salon and the Anthropology Gallery of the Museum d'Histoire Naturelle. After the middle of the century, artists often identified the locality within Africa to which their models belonged or showed them in their original dress. And the anthropological work was increasingly done to distinguish and characterize different tribes and groups um, in uh, ever more places. In the work of, from the beginning of the 20th century of the artist Herbert Ward, one can see a clear separation in his uh, between anthropological heads in which the tribes are specifically identified. Here's Jean Fil Ba Congo uh, and some uh, occasion Indigen Aruimi, for example, and his full length uh, generic images of African life, like Distress or the Tragedy of the Congo, that recall works from an earlier age of abolition. The anthrop anthropological concern with the variety of human types in Africa, with uh, different ways of life according to climate and region, affected artists directly. In paintings influenced by Manet's Olympia, the black female's Africanness is emphasized by clothing, especially head covering. This is notably the case with uh, the impressionist Friedrich Basile's um, young, young woman with peonies uh, in the National Gallery. And there she has an elaborate striped headdress. Anthropometric photography applied to non-Europeans and lower class white people in which the sitter is reduced to a profile and full face image for classification and comparison is again directly descended from Camper and Lavater. It can be seen in photographs by Jacques-Philippe Poteau exhibited in the Anthropology Gallery of the Musée, Museum d'Histoire Naturelle alongside bust by Cordier. They diverge, however, from total emphasis on physiognomy to include identifying clothing. In that respect, they move towards what Elizabeth Edwards has identified as the dominant anthropological mode of representation, the portrait type, in which a full frontal three-quarter length view of the subject is more emphatic in its difference by sharing a convention with portraiture of Europeans, though the latter were more often portrayed 
in a three-quarter view. In Felix Nadar's uh, photographic portrait of Marie Lantilez, the fact that her pose with her cheek resting on her head, possibly derived from an Ang portrait, is conventional, but it only emphasizes her difference for her breasts were partially uh, exposed, uh, denoting the open sexuality of so-called inferior races. With such photographs, there's no clear boundary between their roles as objects of e ethnographic study and tourist souvenirs, nor indeed is there with paintings of black females, which often occupy a space between information and soft pornography. In the later 19th century, the idea of eugenics or racial hygiene was invented, I very, very much regret to say it, University College London in the 1880s by Darwin's cousin Francis Galton, who set up the first chair in eugenics. Eugenics was premised on the fear that the uncivilized masses were breeding at a faster rate than the educated and thus constituted a threat to the social order. The solution was either negative eugenics to restrict breeding of the former by sterilization or birth control and positive eugenics to increase the procreative capacity of the dominant classes. The terrible effects of eugenics on population control in Europe and the United States has often been written about but the effect on artists can be found in a renewed concern with ideal racial types. In Britain, the curious idea of an Anglo-Saxon race is expressed in its ideal physical form in, for example, G.F. Watts' Sir Galahad, uh, which the artist gave a large version of to Eton College to inspire the youth of England. Um, a very small section, I may say, of the youth of England. Um, <laughs> Um, um, in the US, an example close to home of the influence of eugenics can be seen in the figures of the average man and woman displayed in the Columbian exhibition in Chicago of 1893 and now in the Peabody Museum and on display in an excellent exhibition devoted to the, the Columbian exhibition. These figures were made by classically trained artists uh, Henry Hudson Kitson and Alice Ruggles, and the male figure was based entirely on Harvard students, then, of course, overwhelmingly of Anglo-Saxon descent, uh, subtly generalized to conform to a pure classical ideal of Aryan manhood. French eugenics was generally different in character, being based more on Lamarck than Darwin, uh, in the idea that degenerate behavior such as drunkenness and criminality, could be acquired and transmitted from one generation to another. Furthermore, there was a strong French belief that national uh, physical and mental degeneration had caused the humiliating defeat by Germany in 1870, as expressed in the abject figure of France in Rodin's monument, uh, well, un unfinished monument, uh, to the, that war, and you can see this not very clear in the slide, but the very abject figure of France. This led to more emphasis on improving the national stock as a whole and the role of the family, good upbringing, physical and mental health, rather than biologically restricting the uneducated sections of the nation. In, in other words, emphasizing social rather than genetic solutions. This led at the turn of the century to an obsessive emphasis on the healthy male body and its relationship to the, that Greek ideal expressed in ancient white marble sculpture. Uh, and treatises on the body express the uh, idea that physical fitness was essential for the survival and the prosperity of the race. Though this has been much commented on, the racial implications have been less frequently observed, for behind the striving for fitness was a view of the present condition of the human body, ravaged and weakened by city life, where people were subject to sedentary work, alcohol, prostitution, and poor air. It was the modern 
industrial world, in other words, that had caused the French to be defeated by the Germans. But it was the northern European race as a whole that felt under the threat. The Greeks were seen as the forebears of northern Europeans in the physical as well as the philosophical sense. Ancient Greece had been conceived since the late 18th century as the original white civilization and northern Europeans their natural heirs, though in reality the ancient Greeks seem to have seen themselves not as white but as a perfect balance between white and black. But perhaps the greatest artistic legacy of eugenic thinking is the emphasis on the difference between the civilized and the savage and the invention of the primitive as a category. In the years before and after the First World War, and in Paris especially, there arose the idea that Africans were closer to nature and more at ease with their emotions than over-sophisticated urban Europeans, a belief held by the most consciously sophisticated and modern Parisians. This is clearly an element of Picasso's African-influenced works of his Cubist period, which Suzanne Blier has written about marvelously recently, um, but perhaps has its fullest expression in the performances of Josephine Baker, especially the banana dance of 1927. But her uninhibited savagery, uh, supposedly, is also a sign of her modernity. And paradoxically, it is enacted in an African colonial setting before an audience that represented the height of urban sophistication. I want to end by returning to the beginning of this talk. We all remember the shock of the election of Trump after the presidency of Barack Obama and the terrible sense of the return of unreconstructed racism when we thought it, which, when we thought it had retreated. So why has racism been so difficult to defeat despite all that has happened in the 20th century. It's easy to dismiss racism by associating it with total ignorance and by noting its economic roots. But along with redneck beliefs, there's also what one can call golf club racism, which plugs into older sets of beliefs that were once dominant in all Western societies, in which racial difference was not anathema, but boasted by institutions of unimpeachable res respectability. Universities like this one and museums and research institutions. This is not in the dim and distant past, but only a generation or two away. It was the common sense of parents and grandparents. It is this inheritance that continues to overshadow our view of the past. Thank you very much. Take questions, David. I will indeed, yes. <laughs> Thank you for a fascinating talk. Um, you were arguing that it was the respectability of racial science in the 19th century that led it to be uh, so widely incorporated into cultural exp forms of cultural expression. Yes. Um, what is was the role of art and canonical works of art in then in a sense, feeding back into the respectability of racial science? Uh, well, I, I think certainly um, images do perpetuate this and make it seem like common sense. Um, uh, and um, I mean, in, in some cases, I think you can see a certain resistance uh, uh, among artists. But at the time, I think that they simply soaked it up. Uh, as they were bound to do, I think. Um, I mean, uh, there are ideas that somehow artists are apart from society, but uh, I, I think that's wishful thinking, to be honest, by and large. I mean, there are cases of works of art, and of course the whole, one of the ideas behind the image of the black project was to show relationships between black and white that weren't dominated by slavery. And if you look at 
uh, paintings by Velasquez of Juan de Perret, you do uh, see a, um, a form of humanity that is otherwise not represented elsewhere. And in, in other words, the individual relationships are, as it were, often quite strong. But I think in, in broad terms, there isn't really any separate role for artists in all this. No. I want to begin by uh, thanking you for a great presentation. Now, a question. What role did Kant play in this discourse? in the 19th century on philosophical grounds? Uh, well, uh, I think there's <coughs> always a great difference between what Kant said himself and what his influence was. Um, and I think that his influence was in all sorts of different ways that often had very little to do with what he said himself. Um, what he did do, though, in his anthropological work was to um, ex uh, accept clear distinctions between, uh, well, the four great races he talks about. Um, and he does, there's a strong biological element to his theories. Um, he tends to be more on the, uh, um, if we see uh, a, a kind of um, uh, spectrum from, say, Buffon to Linnaeus, he's much closer to Linnaeus and the more categorical distinctions of race. And there are one or two remarks that he makes that, um, you know, are quite racist in, in character. Um, but, of course, he was, you know, living out in Königsberg and would have had, as far as we know, no experience at all of anybody of another race or even of another city. <laughs> um, but, again, when you look at the influence, I, I, there really isn't a, a simple answer to his, the question of his influence because... Uh, even before he died, there was a, a professor of Kantian studies at a German university who interpreted Kant in a much more instrumental way than, than Kant ever saw himself. Um, so I, I, I really haven't got any clear answer to that, that question. <laughs> I'm sorry. Is it all right to, to, to go? No, thank you. Thank you for present, a wonderful presentation. No, it's I call it vintage binder. It's learned, erudite, and always challenging, and always very calm. You know, it, the tone that you present, given the, uh, the catastrophic tornado that you're talking about, is always a fascinating juxtaposition. So it's a tribute to you. But I, my question, I mean, one, of course, with Kant, he, he does change. He, the yeah. early Kant is different than the very later Kant. Yeah. And it has something to do with the legacy of, the t of, of Diderot and those essays in the encyclopedia. And could you say something about those anti-racist Enlightenment figures who seemingly are overlooked and downplayed, and then they come back? So by the time you get to Boaz and Herskovitz and others in the 20th century who are also deeply anti-racist, they become much more mainstream. So they're marginalized. Now, they happen to also be anti-imperialist. They also be very critical of European empires in the Caribbean and so forth. Think about Abi and some of the others. But could you say something about this deeply European Enlightenment strand that was anti-racist, that lost out for a while? Yes. In the 20th century. Well, country? I mean, the one person I've um, worked a bit on is Georg Forster, who's a fascinating figure because he went on the second Captain Cook expedition to the South Seas. Um, and, he, um, and he had a very short life. He ended as a deputy in the, he was German, but he ended as a deputy for Mainz in the uh, uh, French Convention of the, in the Revolution and died, it's believed, from things he picked up on in the South Seas. Um, now, he, he um, is the one person who directly challenged Kant himself and there's quite a number, and he, those articles that Kant wrote of anthropology um, in the 1780s, um, he actually specifically takes on, and, um, and it was very hard to find these. Um, they, they aren't generally widely known. Um, 
but it's a, a, a really interesting episode. Um, and then, of course, there's also Lichtenberg, who was um, a great sp skeptic um, and who quite methodically challenged Lavater's racism. And it was really he was the one who challenged that remark about, uh, about the Newton. Um, and um, what it, uh, you're absolutely right, of course. It, it, it's a sort of tradition that didn't really get picked up at all. Um, and it's really quite hard, as I suggested in the 19th century, to find figures who did resist the uh, implicit racism of, of all those theories, or even converted theories that weren't racist into racist theories. Um, and um, certainly, um, you could hardly even say there's a stream of, 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 of anti-racism that goes through the 19th century. I think it's, you've certainly got it in the 18th century, um, but it, somehow the um, emphasis on measurement and science seem to have, uh, have, have blocked almost all this kind of resistance and, until, as you say, in the early 20th century, it, 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 it comes back. But uh, I don't know, did Franz Boas look back to um, Lichtenberg and Georg Forster? I'd be interested if he did. Um, yeah. Um, thank you so much. I wanted to ask about um, if you have any understanding of like the images like the Black Madonna, the Virgin, quote unquote, the Black Virgin, um, all throughout Europe, and a lot of them are still there. And also, do you have the history of when they started painting Jesus and Mary as white? Because we know they weren't white. Um, well, I mean, this, this is a, a, a really, um, I suppose, hot topic, <laughs> to say the least. Um, um, I, I mean, the real truth is I don't know the answer to that one, but I do know that a lot of black virgin, for instance, the ones in Poland, which are very famous. Um, uh, uh, well, most uh, art historians believe that are simply black by decay and, and thick varnish and so on, and probably not actually conceived as being black. Um, but there are some, certainly, in the 17th century in, in remote places. Um, and then, of course, there is a revival in the 20th century. But um, trying to piece together an earlier history of those. I mean, there are, of course, African versions and, uh, in, in the Congo. Um, but uh, again, I, I think it's, it's, it's highly controversial and very hard to demonstrate one way or the other, really, whether, in fact, uh, uh, a virgin was intentionally black or was simply black by the, the circumstances of, of, of uh, you know, paint chemistry. Um, but how did they get white? That's what I'm trying to, how that's my they, essential question really is when did they start, because we know they weren't white for sure. I mean, uh, yeah. Palestinian Jews were not white. Um, well, it's a question of when you were painting first made of the Virgin Mary, and of course that was again quite late in, in those terms. Um, I mean, in when would they come in? Eighth or ninth century? probably, um, in manuscripts. So already then, the connection with the original virgin would be, you know, very distant. Uh, I mean, the tendency is for people to make them in the color of their own culture. I mean, there wasn't a, a sense of trying to get back to the original appearance of the virgin. Uh, David. Uh, thank you very much for that illuminating pr uh, presentation. And I wanted to ask you to turn back into the scientific texts and talk a little bit about illustration within those texts themselves. Um, I was thinking of uh, one text that really stands out is, and you, you have lithography up there, and it brings it to mind, is uh, Samuel George Morton's Crania Americana which was such a powerful text within the dissemination of so-called scientific racism. Um, and that text was, as I understand it, really powerfully 
um, persuasive in large part because of the introduction of lithographic illustrations um, by John Collins that were so supple and almost strangely present in some way that they sort of reinforced a kind of circuitry of ocular centric evidence or proof. So I'm interested in the sort of the role of the visual itself in um, imprinting uh, this, um, this modality of thinking, this epistemology as it was understood and what kind of regime of the eye in, a, in some ways did the scientific texts themselves either draw upon um, or help pr uh, promulgate. St Stacy made this really interesting point in the workshop last week about the racialization of um, design, of racialization of a visual presentation. Do you see anything of that sort at work? Uh, well, yes, uh, absolutely. And I, I think, um, I mean, I, I could have shown uh, Lovato's volumes were the most magnificently produced works with you know, hundreds of illustrations by uh, all you know, the best artists of the day working for them. And they have a powerful impact, I think. And the, the point about, um, uh, about Camper, those diagrams, it's, I mean, I, I imagine, I mean, they were used in, in, in art schools immediately. In fact, they were designed for artists. Um, and I think they had a very powerful in impact. And I think a lot of people would look at the illustrations and not even need to look at the text uh, to get the idea. And part of the, the reason, I mean, that uh, Camper is so important was that um, if you just look at them visually, um, then you could, it's much easier to draw a racial conclusion from them. But he, he himself emphasizes the relatively small difference between the races. And at no point does he, in fact, associate the African skull with the uh, orangutan. Um, but if you just look at the things visually, all you have to do is draw a line you know, between the European and the African, and then you've got the African one end of the, the spectrum, and then the European then connects up with the Apollo Belvedere. It's got really powerful in that sense. Uh, and of course, Lovata um, commissioned people like Henry Fuseli and all sorts of major artists, and Blake himself worked on some of these uh, as well. And they are very strong images, and they constantly emphasize the connection between, um, well, uh, beauty and virtue and so on. And uh, again, um, I mean, the text is almost unreadable in, in Lavata, but the, it's the images that carry most of the meaning, uh, undoubtedly. Uh, and I think that goes on. And of course, Cuvier um, used images as well. I could easily have shown them to you um, as well. And there's a long tradition of that uh, in the 19th century, of uh, illustrated textbooks. Um, so I think the answer is the visual has everything to do with with the dissemination of these ideas. Thanks, David. Um, uh, so I have two questions that are sort of outside of the temporal frame of uh, your presentation. And one is, um, and they're, they're directly related to each other. One is, um, do you have a sense, or uh, can you give us a sense of what images of blacks looked like pre-scientific racism in art. Um, and the second question is, um, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, the new scientific racism, you can say, is sort of residing in sort of genomic ideas about race, genetic ideas about race. And I'm curious if you feel like there's been any sorts of changes in um, the aesthetics of racial representation that has been shaped by the sort of new genomic understanding of race. Thank okay, you. Right, well, the, the first question, um, what is really extraordinary is the um, uh, it was very strong stereotypes that existed long before the 19th century. Um, and uh, Joshua Reynolds you know, talks about, again, the, the hair, snub noses, large lips. It's these, this sort of trio. And this is behind um, almost all the representations from the Renaissance onwards. Um, and this is seen as a given uh, of 
any representation. Um, and in a way, that, um, it, I think, inflects the scientific view. I mean, again, if you look at um, Kampfer's, um, you can see, again, how completely it, it embodies that same idea, again, with the, the lips and the so on, and the hair. Um, and, um, and I think these uh, you know, go back at least the Middle Ages. Um, uh, before that, you often get just simply a, a, you know, a black skin color, um, with very little differentiation of physiognomy. That's really the Renaissance that does that, I think, to differentiate one individual physiognomies. Um, but that, that remains very strong. And in a way, I think that um, there's a lot of choice. I mean, a lot of the um, uh, young, the slaves you see in early paintings were actually selected. Um, you know, they weren't just picked randomly. And I think they were meant to follow that kind of, of stereotype. So stereotypes tend to be endlessly reinforcing. Um, now, the, the second question, that's a rather harder one. Um, um, you, you're talking about contemporary art and how, the, yes. Um, gosh, I, I don't know quite where to start with that one. Um, I mean, there's certainly artists who are, who are interested in, in those sort of issues. Um, but I, I, I really, I'm not sure I can think of any precise examples at this point, but uh, I'll have a think and talk to you <laughs> later about that. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, I, I have a question. Yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Bindman. Bindman. Um, I was ill at ease on uh, observing the uh, Musée d'Orte uh, d'Orsay painting Olympia. Yes. And the reason was that I saw a very definite uh, gender motive behind it, yes. um, which distinguished or which gave the black servant far more dignity than the white model. And uh, I saw this also in Moula Press. Uh, I'm not sure if you agree. Uh, there is, in many of these instances, a hierarchy um, which is somewhat challenged um, by the juxtaposition of the black woman and the white woman, especially when the white woman is nude and uh, the black woman is fully clothed and has uh, another more dignified position, at least so it seems to me. Yes, I, I, I'm not sure how you measure dignity, really, in these things, but um, I mean, there's no doubt that the black w would have been a servant and is signified as a servant by, again, her skin color. Um, uh, I mean, it could well be that in, in the process of, of undermining the artistic hierarchy that Mane was also trying to uh, undermine the social hierarchy as well, but it's quite hard to demonstrate that, I think. Um, uh, I mean, certainly she has a stronger presence, and I think that could well be to do with the fact that in uh, making the figure of the uh, of Olympia uh, naturalistic. She's removing the, the, all the elements that give her uh, a sort of higher place in the, the hierarchy, as it were. I mean, in other words, she's not a Venus. She is a, a real person. So in that sense, she's down at the same level. Um, and and the, the elements that separate her from um, the, the servant are... are, are, are simply gotten rid of. Um, so I think that's worth thinking about, yes. To learn about things that aren't in the high art realm. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking particularly of the way in which engravings uh, of the travel literature, for example, the shift yes. rather substantially from the copper plate to the steel plate. Yes. And then again through the popular press, what might be called the, the yellow press, um, from mid-19th century onwards, and then the whole period of the representation 
of Africans in particular when there are conflicts like the Zulu War or the Ashanti campaign or the like. Yes. Um, anybody who's been looking at the, uh, what might be called the popular imagery of <laughs> blacks uh, realizes there's a, an enormous transformation from the 18th century to the 19th century and a movement from a quasi noble status in the popular literature of travelogues in the 18th century to a kind of infantile um, yes. status in the 19th century. A kind of yes. um, it's the discovery, in a sense, of the dark continent uh, just after the Enlightenment. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there is, uh, yes. But again, I think the, the tendency of popular imagery is to reinforce stereotypes and, uh, in a way, they, they help as kind of reduction of the imagery into um, often really quite sort of simple terms. Um, and, uh, but what, what's also interesting in the 19th century, at least in um, Britain, and I think to some degree in the, um, in the US, is that the Irish become, um, pick, somehow inherit or pick up some of the uh, terms in which Africans were represented. In other words, they often shown as more animalistic in their physiognomy in the, in the 19th century. Um, and, and this is an extraordinary phenomenon, really. Um, and uh, I, I think that, there, I mean, as always in these things, there are sort of counter tendencies as well. And I think in the uh, age of abolition, there is a certain counter tendency to look more sympathetically on on, on, uh, on Africans um, and then see the Irish as somehow representing the degenerate part of the population. Um, so all these things shift, I think, are always in, in motion, as you say. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I think th that your point about the difference in technology is is an important one, and um, I mean, lithography, in, in a way, gives you more tonal control um, than, well, engraving, wood engraving technologies, and it's very hard to represent differences in skin color in, in engraving or, um, or wood cutting, but probably easier in lithography. Um, that certainly that's the case. Um, and, and of course, lithography was much more ubiquitous. I mean, you can, it, it's a, a much more, uh, if you like, efficient technology than, than line engraving or, or wood cutting. Um, and so that it, it spreads imagery much more widely. But again, you've also got color lithography too, which comes in as well. So yes, it does, I think, change the terms in the 19th, throughout the 19th century. Yeah. Hi, David, thank you so much. Um, I told you when I first met you, I've been a fan of the work for a long time and the image of the black and Western art was so important to my own uh, research on uh, the history of black pornography. Um, and today you gave us a master class in this work in art history and racial science. And I wanted to build upon uh, Ken Benson's comments about the ocular and ask about the scopophilic realm of, um, and the kind of, uh, work of the ethnographic as a sphere of pornographic um, interest in visual art by these, sci by the, these scientists, artists, actually. Yes. Um, and, and ask about the kind of complexity that I think that I, perhaps in my own work, may need to develop in terms of how we think about sexuality as this, another way in which, at least in the early period, becomes uh, like the Hottentot Venus, proof of difference, proof of 
uh, this um, essential animality um, and savagery, um, and it gets mobilized towards these polygenesis theories uh, with Cuvier's student, Agassiz, um, yeah. from Harvard, who does the work <laughs> through photography yes. in the United States, right? But then we have these other kinds of images that you referred to, like the photograph of the woman from Antilles, Antilles where you mentioned about the openness of her shirt suggesting an open sexuality, right? And so I wondered if you could help us tease out some of the ways in which sexuality um, informs these kind of racial uh, scopophilic, uh, very... Um, um, explorations and titillation involved <laughs> in in the work of the science art matrix here, and um, and an addendum to that is that I wonder if there's any way because I'm always fascinated with the people and the images that um, any knowledge you have about the actual artists, I mean, excuse me, the actual models that were used by. Manet or Jericho or who these people might have been and if there's any way to recuperate, recover um, who the models were in real life and what their lives may have been and what their experience of being used as these images might have been. Yeah, well, um, that's a pretty large <laughs> question, I must have said. I mean, all I can do is to uh, look again at Aspasie, and we know that Delacroix had a particular taste for models, and, and, and in fact, um, he, he did actually have sex, he records having sex with them um, in his uh, journals. And um, so this is very much, I think, part of his attraction towards uh, Aspasie. Um, but I would also see this as in a wider context of this whole cult, really, of the, the Belle Moulatress uh, in colonial, uh, well, in, in the French colonies. Um, and the, the Moulatress was clearly seen as a, um, one of the uh, attractions of the, the colonies for people in the city. And, and I think there's been quite a lot, so much emphasis on slavery and um, and plantations that one often forgets that most of the white population that came to the colonies was not were not slave owners. They were, if you like, exploiters. But they were looking basically for uh, you know women and having a good time and you know possibly um, making money out of slavery. Um, but this notion um, that there are these. Uh, and, of course, the Mulatress would have been mixed race um, by definition. Um, but they also do, do seem to have presented a kind of social class in themselves in the French colonies. Um, they often owned businesses. Um, they were, um, uh, you know, on the whole, um, remarkable people who um, knew exactly what they were doing and... Uh, and saw the situation they were in. Um, and um, so th there's that sort of complexity at that level, I think, um, that tradition, if you like, which goes through uh, 19th century France. Um, and again, we don't know anything much else about Aspasie, but there were several models who were... Um, uh, usually of mixed race, who were in Paris at the time. And they might well have put the word out that there was you know, work to be had um, as a model. Um, and, uh, of course, you find also in the later 19th century that they tend to go into uh, entertainments as well. Um, and there's the fascinating case in the exhibition of Miss Lala, um, who is in, in subject to the famous Degas painting where she's being hauled up by her teeth. Um, and she was, um, had all sorts of indignities, um, but, you know, was clearly a, an extraordinary kind of athlete as well as everything else. Um, so there is that a sort of place that they begin to work out, I think, whatever the situation is um, in, in the 19th century. Um, so you often get 
quite large, well, uh, large groups in, in Paris for a start. Um, but again, I think you, you talked about photography and I, I think that's a, a whole other thing again, which is the use of photography as pornography, um, absolutely. And the, the this, well, I, I can remember from my youth, the geographical magazine was, you know, again, a kind of bridge between, uh, <laughs> you know, pornography and serious anthropology. Um, but, um, so I think there are these, these, if you like, these sort of liminal places that uh, uh, people can exploit and find a place in. <laughs> David, thank you very much for that excellent presentation. I certainly appreciate it. I have a couple of questions. Um, one relates to sort of uh, preservation and, let's say, accessibility. And the other relates to sort of application of the racial science and French politics. I noticed uh, in your sources from the museums that you did not need to go to three, the most important three museums in Paris that deal with Africans, the Musée de l'Homme and the uh, Quai Branly and the other one, which I have a junior moment now. I happened to have given a lecture there a couple of years ago, <laughs> but I've forgotten the name yes. of it. And I noticed that you didn't mention that. that e well, any I, of those I didn't. Are sources. Does that mean that? material is so widespread that you don't have to go to these specialized sources? Well, I think it's a question of the, the, the date. The Quai Brawny is not that old. And, uh, and in fact, the Museum d'Histoire Naturelle is the, the forerunner. So at the time I, I was referring to them uh, in the earlier part of the 19th century, that's what they were. Mm -hmm. So the Musée de l'Homme, when, when did it become the Musée de l'Homme? Uh, I think sometime in the 19th century. Yeah. Or maybe even 20th century, I'm not sure. Does anyone know? No, I don't. Yeah. Anyway, I'm just sort of curious. What about the application of this racial science to the Congress of Berlin, um, which, well, as you know, divided, the European yes. powers divided. Uh, well, how, how, much did, how much of this uh, science, racial science, did the French specifically take to this conference? Well, I, I think that all the Allied powers would have taken some ideas. I mean, the very idea of feeling you could just move in on Africa has a, 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 a you know, a racial dimension. Um, you know, you're bringing responsible government to a place that supposedly didn't have it. So I think the, 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 the whole venture has a, a strong, you know, idea of, of, of difference uh, of the people who are being exploited. So, yes, I mean, it's, I would have thought, deeply in there uh, at all points. Uh, and the whole question of, <coughs> I mean, after all, colonialization does Im imply you have the right to take over someone else's uh, land um, by direct exploitation. And if you think, feel these people are like yourself, then it's a different matter. You wouldn't want, you know, feel you can take over you know, <coughs> occupy France or, or German, well, you might, uh, but, um, <laughs> but, um, but, but not in that way. You wouldn't simply go in and, you know, move in on the mineral rights and so on uh, in that sort of way. So I think that the, there's got to be some idea of, uh, of, idea of Africa and Africans um, that, that, that enables you to justify going in there. One last um, question, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, David, for uh, a wonderful uh, presentation. Um, when one of the images that you used is, uh, is the one on the flyer here, which uh, reminded me very much of 17th century Casta paintings uh, from uh, Spanish America. Yes. Um, and I wanted um, you to uh, speak a little bit about some of the differences that you see between the Casta paintings in the 17th century and uh, this one in particular as related to racial science. Um. Yes. Well, the, the Casta paintings are very extremely interesting. Um, and they are, uh, in fact, they're 18th century rather than 17th century. Uh, and they are um, an attempt to um, bring some order to the uh, very confused 
situation in, well, it's in fact in Mexico. I think there's some in Peru, but it's almost entirely Mexican. Um, and they show uh, different kinds of mixtures, but always, uh, in a sense, three-way, because you've got the native population, the Spanish occupiers, and the, the black population. And so they show these, all, all the possibilities that come um, from um, uh, conjunction between these two, uh, the, these three, um, and they are, in, I mean, they are sort of scientific in a, in a way, um, and they have different names for all of these, and of course, those names are uh, associated with status, that the, obviously the best thing is to be, uh, in, in society, is to be wholly Spanish, but you can, by um, a, a number of degrees, return to being fully Spanish, according to the the caster systems. Um, so those are a, a very specific thing, and they aren't just concerned with Africans at all. It's, uh, it's um, it, 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 I mean, there are some Africans in them, but it's not, not the only thing. Um, so they're in a very different context. Um, the, uh, the, the, the Basile painting, um, I, I think, is much more um, uh, about exoticism, really, and the um, um, uh, and um, and I think a recognition of colonialism too, um, that that uh, and the recognition that there are different kinds of people in Africa, um, and you get that realization, particularly from mid nineteenth century. It's what anthropology does and begins to do at that point is to say, well, there are different types of people in Africa, indeed in all countries as well. And I don't think that uh, Basile had any great um, anthropological purpose in, in the painting, but uh, I think it's much more probably pictorial that he sees this as being a, a way of ex exoticizing the everyday and bringing it into line with um, Orientalist painting as well, which was then very fashionable. Um, so I think they're really different worlds. <laughs>